Uh, thank you so much for uh, all, everyone coming today. You know, it's weird in the in the in the class I teach. I'm pretty young, and but I remember you know being in in university uh, when 9/11 uh, took place, and I mean just such a, a seminal moment in, in in even personality in thinking about it. And now uh, in these classes, you have students who were in fifth and sixth grade when it happened, and their only recollection of it is what they see in a movie or listening to political arguments of how it gets referenced. And um, so we've been talking a lot, uh, the group together. I'm just happy that everyone's here today. And what we called the event was Rules of Engagement at Home and Abroad. And the idea was that we know that the tragedy of 9-11 is a continuing legacy in the American psyche. You know, it's in political commentary, movies. We have all this set of images with it. And oftentimes, those images seem to be this post-9-11 world. We think of smoking buildings, you know, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, desert landscapes. That's how it usually gets represented to us. Or it, it has a fetishized idea of, of the veteran. Um, but what we wanted to do today, like in the space we have together, is to shift focus to reflect on the challenges that active and service people and veterans face not only when they're deployed, but then when they come home. And uh, the idea is that the really, some of the most dramatic uh, moments of combat are actually when you're back in the States. And that there's a silent uh, battle that's going on on a daily basis uh, with the heroes of our country, and, and no one's thinking about it. Or not in a, in a coherent way that's actually addressing the problem. And that's not only in the nation, or in Jackson, but that's even at our law school. You know, it's been a, a massive failing uh, on our part, and, and not out of a lack of goodwill, but it just hasn't happened. So what we thought today is uh, we're happy you came here to uh, join us, and we were thinking that we would talk about different aspects of that. I wanted just to introduce you to the three people. We'll keep it short. There are about 10 minutes uh, per talk, and we'll have about 20, 30 minutes afterwards for sort of just a conversation with each other. Uh, if that sounds like a good format, and we'll just go from there. Um, we have, uh, at the far end, we have Professor Evan Simone. He's the director of our legal uh, writing program at MC Law, and he also serves as a major in the Army Reserve component with duties as senior defense counsel. I could keep going about Evan, but you'll see him on 60 Minutes pretty soon. You'll get to know him a little bit more. Uh, Professor Richard Meyer is director of our LLM program. Uh, awesome scholar, and in addition to that, uh, he also uh, was senior fellow at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and served as judge advocate, field artillery commander, and military intelligence specialist for the U.S. Army from 1985 to 2007. Uh, and then we have Mr. Ronnie Carbo. Ron Carbo is a second-year student at MC Law, and he's also a United States Marine Corps Operation Desert Storm veteran and a great musician and re uh, recording artist on the side. Okay, sorry guys, but it's true. Uh, so uh, we're gonna just go uh, down. Uh, Evan's talk is the court's vital role of first response and post-combat readjustment. Richard Meyer will be talking on outlaw heroes in the wake of a legalized battlefield. And uh, Mr. Carbo is gonna be talking on making merit-based accommodations accessible at the law school. All right, so. I'm going to shut up now. I'm out of the picture. And without further ado, Mr. Simone. Did you need to talk? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's me, right? Go for it. All right. For me, on 9 11, uh, I was in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the United States Army JAG School. And uh, after the first plane hit, about five minutes after it hit, we were in class studying international law at the moment, a group of 44 lawyers from all four services. And uh, the instructor, uh, another instructor came in and interrupted the class that we just had uh, the uh, World Trade Tower hit by a plane. But we didn't think of this as an international incident. It was just a notification. But we decided we were going to take a break in class and turn on the, the television and the big screens and watch it together. And immediately we kicked into 
analysis as to what could have been the cause, whether it was accidental, whether it was serious. We had charts already on it. We were arguing through all the possibilities when the second plane hit. And the second plane hit, I, if I remember in the order, hit the Pentagon. It didn't just hit the Pentagon. The Pentagon has five sections, Pentagon. The, each one dedicated to the four major services and then one dedicated to DOD. The plane that hit the Pentagon hit the Army side of the Pentagon, which means that for 37 of us who were active duty Army, we suddenly knew the people that had died. They were our mentors, they were our friends, and in some cases they were our family members. But that wasn't what we focused on. What I felt and what the other officers that were there with me suddenly felt was this overwhelming wave of impotence. And you gotta understand how odd that is. We joined the military, and never in the military do you truly feel impotent. The military is all about enabling. It's all about giving you the authority. If you don't like the way system, something is operating, you report it, you work at it. Particularly if you're an officer, you try to change it. But impotence is something that's never an option. It's, it's work at it and solve it. And so they have this whole room looking at each other and feeling incredibly impotent at us. That was powerful. It was just silence. And we're like all registering, one, we're being hit by an enemy. We're the first military to have failed since 1941. Because since, since 1941, none of our civilians had ever been touched. We had been able to fight almost all of World War II without American civilians being touched. Korea, Vietnam, our civilians weren't touched. Now we were gonna be remembered as a military generation that had failed because someone was able to bring the, the war to our shores. One of our strategies for a long time is the way to win a war is fight it on somebody else's land, not on your own, and we had failed at that. So impotence and failure were the things that we felt. Lots of people thought, oh, it's got to be anger. It's got to be, you know, impotence and failure. And it lasted for about 10 minutes, just morose silence in a room, in a room that would normally full of 44 lawyers would never be silent. And then we started picking the plane. We organized based on how we were going to find out who the, the casualties were, what family members we might be able to reach. We were only 100 miles from D.C. We started organizing how we were going to reach families to make sure people were taken care of. We started trying to download the, the rosters of everyone that was in the Army side of the Pentagon. Um, and then that plan just progressed because then we started focusing on New York. Um, but we were focusing more on the Pentagon because that was our region. Um, when the plane went down in Pennsylvania, we started looking at where was it, what towns were it, how could we identify what, if any, soldiers were from that town and moving forward. Right, so that's the way the military is. We kind of see a problem, and then we start moving to see how we're going to fix it. So that's what I'm using that as the intro of my talk. There's three thoughts, three main points I want to make this morning about the military and military experience in law school. And I'm going to divide it into three areas. I'm going to start by talking about the mistake that we, our military always makes, but necessarily, and that is we always fight the last war. Initially, we always are stuck fighting the last war rather than the current one. Then I'm going to talk about the unique legal environment and social environment that is the modern day battlefield. And then I'm going to end with how those two link to the profound effects of PTSD in the law school environment. So let me back up to fighting the last war. In Vietnam, Soldiers who, uh, who processed back from Vietnam would often be in their living room in civilian clothes the same day they left the combat zone. That same day, counting the, the time delay, because it would be, they did they gain hours as they were traveling back, but they would be released from Vietnam at eight o'clock in the morning, and by eight o'clock that night, they were in civilian clothes in their living room. We could have not done a greater disservice to those veterans. The battlefield is such a unique environment that you need a transition period. You need the ability to uh, 
redirect, to, to refocus, and to relearn your role in society. Because the battlefield is dramatically different. And Vietnam was the first time where we fought an asymmetric enemy. That's a, that's a modern buzz, buzzword among the military, asymmetric warfare. You see, all the war movies you, you watch, and everything, it's always about symmetric warfare. That being equal opponents. We fight the Nazis the wave upon wave of Germans, and we've got ours. Or we fight the Japanese, or the Civil War, North or South. It's always two countries fighting each other. Asymmetric warfare is the idea of an advanced country fighting a disorganized group of individuals. In Vietnam, it was truly asymmetric. We had much greater capability and power than the Vietnamese. We were organized better. We were trained better. But we weren't really ready to fight an asymmetric war. We wanted to know where the enemy was. If we could find the enemy, we could kill him. And so, how did they react? They became the enemy we couldn't find. It's estimated that 80% of people injured in Vietnam never saw an enemy soldier. Think about that statistic. 80% of those who were injured never saw an enemy soldier. How would that affect you if you never knew where it was coming from? Never. You never even got to point and shoot at the person who was trying to kill you, and yet you'd watch your buddy be blown to bits next to you. So we reacted to Vietnam this time and we adjusted and we said we're going to have a transition period. Soldiers are never going to go directly from that battlefield back to their living room. And so we said we're, we're going to have this transition period where we're going to hold them and you'll see soldiers oftentimes on redeployment stuck in this large warehouse building for a couple days going through briefings and rebriefings before they are released back in the community which is better than it was. But you know what? The war on terror and the war in Afghanistan is not the war in Vietnam. And that's where I want to move to my second point to, to epitomize why it's not. Uh, as uh, Professor Asper mentioned, they talk about outlaw heroes. The term outlaw is a common law term. It means someone who is outside the protections of the law. And it, when, you, when you are declared an outlaw by the king, it means that anyone can kill you without legal consequence because the law no longer protects you. So if I've been declared outlaw and you see me walking down the road, you can pull out your long bow and, and kill me and brag about it and have no consequence whatsoever. That is the modern day battlefield. Because those who are killing us, if they are privileged belligerents, they're outside the law. They get to kill us without facing any form of criminal prosecution. But oh, by the way, they're outlaws too. We can kill them on sight. We don't have to wait for them to be doing something bad. They might be a very, very good person, a violin player who's a great parent, but if they're a member of the enemy military, I'm going to shoot them while they sleep. I'm not going to wait for them to threaten me. I'm going to kill them on sight. I don't care if they're good or bad or anything else. I just care that they are a member of the military that I'm fighting with because they're outside the protections of law and so am I. So if I try to give them a chance to surrender, I might, it's not about risking my life, I might be risking the life of the person standing next to me. And that's one thing that's unforgivable. The one thing we learn in the military indoctrination is that you take care of the people to your right and to your left. That's what it's all about. And I want to introduce that. For those of you who haven't served, our indoctrination process is very, very, very effective. And I don't mean to use indoctrination in a pejorative manner. When we shave your head, when we take away all your civilian clothes, when we teach you how to walk and talk and act in a totally different manner, it is indoctrination at its deepest level. We are bringing you into a new world, a new family that defines your existence to the point where most soldiers, I mean, talking from a criminal prosecution paradigm, 
most soldiers focused more on getting kicked out of the military than they did the punishment they might have served. I can't count the number of criminal defendants who said, well, I'll go to jail for six years as long as I can come back to my unit after I'm done. Because to be exiled from that family after you've been brought into it, when you're in the military, we operate as a separate part of society. Every single major military installation is designed and fully functional to operate if you shut down those gates. If you close those gates and they had to operate totally on their own, they would do so. They don't depend on anything outside their gates. It's a separate world. And so all your friends, all your acquaintances, all your co-workers, and it's this world. And so to be exiled from it is the worst thing you can think of. And so what puts you outside that community, even if you're there, is the thing most soldiers don't want to be is cowards or malingerers. Coward is someone that is afraid to do their job. A malingerer is someone who avoids doing their job for whatever reasons, be it personal reasons or just laziness. Those are two things that the military ethic looks very down at. And so no one ever wants to be a coward and no one ever wants to be a malingerer because if you are, you're outside the family. You're outside the family. You're a waste of air. You're a waste of oxygen is how it is talked. If you're going to be a malingerer, if you're not going to do your job, if you're not going to fulfill the role that you've been assigned, you're a waste of oxygen. The phrase that was used when I was there. And so I'm going to leave, use that to go back to my third point, which is what I'm building to. This fighting the last war, outlaws, malingering, and power of exile, all leading to law school and PTSD. Remember, we're soldiers, we're terrified of not carrying our weight, we're terrified of cowards, and oh, by the way, we're terrified of being exiled, being outside the family. Now put that soldier and that veteran in the law school environment. First, we like to think of things as much as possible. We try to get to black and white. We know that it's a world of gray, but we try to get to black and white as much as possible. And so as much, if we can identify enemy and friendly, that's what we're shooting for. Sometimes we can't. There's a gray area, but we always try to get to clears enemy, clears friendly. Well, in the law school environment, who is that? Who's the enemy? Who's the friend? You can make a lot of arguments. You could say, my classmates are my competitive enemy. I'm competing for the grade, so I should look at them as the enemy. Or I could look at the law professor. That's absolutely the enemy because he's trying to embarrass me. He's trying to power me. In some ways, military experience helps us because we're not afraid of being wrong because we've been wrong a lot. And as I told my first law professor when I would raise my hand and say the stupidest thing imaginable, and uh, he would let the whole class know that what I had said was the stupidest thing imaginable, after class he'd be like, I can't believe you had the guts to raise your hand again. And I said, sir, don't take this the wrong way, but you're an amateur. Drill sergeants have said far worse things to me than you could ever imagine. So if all you're going to do is call me stupid, I'll keep raising my hand because I can deal with that. But I can't deal with cowardice, and I can't deal with malingering, and I can't deal with exile. And now I've got this added thing. For six months or a year of my life from that deployment I get back from, I don't know who that enemy is, and I spend every waking moment terrified of the enemy I can't see. Not really terrified, but fearful, looking for, planning, terrified that what I am terrified of is I'm going to make a mistake that's going to cost him his life. So things that you aren't afraid of, I'm terrified of. I'm afraid that the plastic bag in the road that I'm going to... Uh, uh, I, you know what, it's probably nothing, but that one time I don't swerve to avoid it, it's going to be an IED and it's going to cost him his life. So I'm terrified of it. I'm not terrified of being told I'm stupid, but I'm being, I'm terrified of doing the wrong thing that's going to cause 
think it looks stupid. I'm really terrified of doing the thing that's going to cause me to not be part of his club. Or wait, maybe he's the enemy of me. Well, I don't know. One of the things that the military gives us is a role. And that's the great comfort. We know your lane. This is my lane. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to care about. Law school is all about breaking down that role, breaking down that lane. And you really aren't sure. What am I supposed to be doing at any given moment? Am I supposed to be using supplements? Am I not? Am I supposed to be raising my hand? Am I not? Am I supposed to be creating an outline or a checklist? I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing. And every time I think I'm getting it right, I get explained to you why that's probably the dumbest thing anyone's ever done in the classroom. So I'm not, what I do, I'm getting it wrong. It seems familiar to me, except for in the Army, after getting it wrong five or six times, I eventually get it right, and I know I can move on. And I don't get that moment in law school. Nobody ever says, yep, now you're on top of it, now you're getting it right. So now I'm a PTSD guy. I'm somebody that has been in this outlaw environment where I don't know where the enemy has come from, and I don't know who I can trust. As a matter of fact, people, the contractors I was told to trust, I couldn't. The classmates that I think, professors say work together, I think I should trust them, but wait, I seem to think they might be working against me. And I don't want to appear weak, cowardly, or malingering, so I keep my mouth shut. And that is the worst thing for a PTSD person to do. Keep their mouth shut. Keep your head down. That's what I was told, keep my head down, keep my mouth shut. In a law school environment where the stress is higher than anywhere else we've ever been, but it's not a stress that really ex explains itself well. Trying to explain the stress of a law school classroom to someone who wasn't there is like trying to ex explain the stress of a battlefield to someone who wasn't there. But at least in the battlefield, I can turn to somebody else who's been there and I can say, yeah, you went through this too, didn't you? But in law school, I can't do that because then I appear weak, I appear cowardly, and I appear like I'm not doing my job. So I keep my head down and I keep to myself. And then I'm locked in my own head. And then I start imagining things. The stress just overwhelms me. And then all I want to do is escape any way I can. So this is a new war. This is a new stress. This type of PTSD is not what happened in Vietnam or World War II or World War I when it was shell shock or the thousand yard stare. This is a new type of battlefield with the same paradigm, though, that I was outside the law, and now I've got to figure out the new rules of it. But I'm not part of my family anymore, where I have everybody experiencing the same thing. I'm surrounded by civilians who don't speak the same language I do necessarily. And everybody seems to be getting it, and I'm not, or vice versa, and it's a realm I'm not prepare to deal with. The Army always gave me a training to prepare for each thing. Law school is the opposite. We don't prepare you to deal with each new challenge. We expect you, we give you a new challenge and expect you to figure it out on your own. And I'm not ready for that. So all of this combines to what I think is the problem we face today. I'm not about providing a solution right now, but what I'd like to do is move my talk to someone who has gone through that, being the PTSD guy, in the law school environment for the next set of our discussion, and we'll be sure I'm proud of Thank you. I'd like to start my talk. I'm going to start back from when I was 22 years old, deployed into, uh, rode this plane over into Saudi Arabia, landed at 4.30 in the morning in a hostile area. A hostile area. When I stepped off that plane, I could hear all of the all of the, the recordings and, and the prayers coming over the loudspeakers all over the country. It was very weird. I didn't know how to re I didn't know how to re you know relate to that. It was just different. So then we got deployed out into the field. We went to a forward base. Didn't take a shower for the first 30 days. Didn't have a hot meal. Didn't even use a didn't even use a regular toilet. No light. For the first 30 days. All you can smell is dead bodies. They shot artillery at us twice a day at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening, then again at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning to make sure you don't sleep. From then we moved into 
I read. Most of it I read the area. A lot of people were killed in the process. We lost at least five of my unit. A lot of kids were killed. Animals. The smell the flowers, the, the flies flying around. So a kid coming from New Orleans, real laid back, decent neighborhood. This was a big change for me. A big change. A lot of things I'd never seen before. The boot camp doesn't prepare you for that. Marines make you tough. And it makes you feel as though you're, you know, indestructible. But it doesn't prepare you for the battlefield. And we fought for a good, you know, the ground war. We were spotters for the artillery. We were spotters for the planes coming in. And all of that. We went in Kuwait City. Hell Highway, we were part of that. Task Force Ripper helped to take back the city. And then we get ready to come back home. The day we get ready to get on the plane to come back, one of my guys in the unit drops his sea bag on the ground. It blew up. He was smuggling something back. I don't know what was in the sea bag, but it blew up. Five guys got hurt. So now I'm completely tearing paranoid about getting on the plane to come back home. That was the scariest time in the whole world was coming back. And I thought, I was like, I made it through this far. I hope this plane doesn't crash. So then we got back to the country. I was married at the time. I would argue a lot with my wife, friends. And I started feeling very, very depressed. But I couldn't understand why I was depressed. Tears coming out of my eyes. This heavy weight, I could never figure out what it was. As he would say, it was PTSD. I had no idea what PTSD was. I didn't even know, I didn't even know about it. It took me 10 years to get right. And it's almost at a point, not quite there yet. As you can tell, as you can tell, it's starting to change now. It takes a lot. So you, know, you go to treatment. The VA doesn't provide health care when you get back, which is tough because if I would have gotten treatment earlier, I probably would have been okay. But it took a while. I'm 20 years now. I've been out of war 20 years now. It's still affecting me, as well as a lot of veterans that you'll see out there, probably these guys also, and man, a few other guys. So now, I go to school. I go to my undergrad, to my master's, and my air specialist degree. Some classes, you may struggle a little bit. I didn't know anything about accommodations, because no one at the school would ever say anything about it. I didn't know that you could get additional time, or you could take an exam in a room by yourself, or you could get notes from the teacher. Or you could be, have the ability to record your lectures. No one ain't made that available to us. So my part of the speech, what I would like to see is, it's very important for universities to, when you fill out your law school application, or any application, you check that box that says veteran. That should send a message to the university that we need to send out at least note uh, some type of a PDF or some type of a file making this veteran aware of all of his benefits and all of the accommodations that they may need in order to be successful in school. It's, it's very important. Like most vets, I, I met several vets here at the school and some of them didn't even know about vocational rehab. Some of them had never even filed for their benefits and they struggled. You know, some of them, you know, they're having problems on the test because PTS, what PTSD will do is it will, it makes it difficult for you to focus, concentration, you're better irritable. Me and Professor Myers talked about this. For the last 20 years, I've never slept more than four hours a night. And those four hours are broken. It's never a straight four hours. The total is no more four, four and a half hours a night. That's all the sleep I get for 20 years. And all that's because of PTSD. It's a serious illness 
เราคิดของเราทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้วทำแบบนั้นแล้
that they have needs if we're able to identify those needs. And that's what I want to talk about just a bit today with you, uh, specifically how the legal system and our courts are transforming specifically to recognize the needs of veterans who have treatment requirements and who have conditions and who have been traumatized by combat. Uh, so the title of this presentation is The Court's Vital Role of First Response in Post-Combat Readjustment. Uh, because I, I do have a, a service function now, I do want to say that these are only my own opinions. I'm not representing the opinions of the uh, Armed Forces in any way or the Department of Veterans Affairs. And in fact, uh, I'm offering a perspective that uh, I, I don't think they would want to say they endorse even. And that's okay. But fortunately, they've been wonderful about letting me speak in a personal capacity. I've had a chance to work with judges and family courts to help train them about the special needs of veterans. Uh, child custody issues and uh, how uh, combat affects families and deployments and when you're thinking about something like the best interests of the child, there's a need to look at the military family in a different way and understand unique experiences that they've had within the military culture. And oftentimes I talk to uh, judges and others who've created specialized programs to deal with veterans in the court system. So I want to just give you a, a few thoughts today. I think if we want to think of this as a primary mission here, to use a military vernacular, it's really to understand that the family and criminal courts are becoming one of the first places where society has the ability to identify treatment needs for a service-related trauma. And that reality imposes a specific systemic responsibilities. I'd say the same type of responsibility we talked about of identifying veterans who are law students and, and the manner in which law school presents additional challenges. Uh, in a way, we have the same kind of recognition of special responsibilities in our court systems. What I'd like to talk about today specifically would be first this idea of operational stress injuries. I, I use that term because it's not only post-traumatic stress disorder. The, the three most common disorders from combat operations are traumatic brain injury, major depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. But we're going to talk about the fact that you can experience some symptoms of these diagnoses without meeting all of them and still have some major treatment needs, even though you don't have the full-blown diagnosis to go along with it. And in some cases, the medical literature is actually showing that if you experience just some symptoms of PTSD, you can possibly experience them more acutely than if you had the full-blown disorder. So we, we have an umbrella of various types of responses we're going to talk about. And one good term to use to capture it all is operational stress injuries. Another thing we're going to talk about is, is this problem of a stigma against seeking treatment. The whole idea about being part of a community, a family, not exiled, not looked at as someone who is trying to malinger, right? That unfortunately being so prominent in military culture becomes a major reason why service members do not want to seek treatment while they're on uh, active duty, while they're actively serving in the reserves, because, and we'll talk about this, one of the most common reasons why is that you don't want to be perceived as leaving your team when teamwork and a shared mission and vision is so fundamental to unit cohesion and success on the battlefield. So a lot of individuals, even though they have problems, are either in denial or ignoring their symptoms because they want to still keep giving, not exclude themselves from their unit. They want to, you know, they want to enhance mission accomplishment. And as a result, all of that delay sometimes creates even more exacerbation of their symptoms. And that's, in my view, why a lot of folks are coming back with needs that have not been addressed during active service and only after the fact. 
I want to describe the sequential intercept model to you, what that is. It's a framework for dealing with persons who have mental illness, who need help in the criminal justice system. And I want to show you, uh, finally, at the conclusion of this presentation, how the sequential intercept model has actually been incorporated specifically to address the problems of veterans who are involved in the criminal justice system. So operational stress injuries, in short, I kind of call it unique hardships from predictable occupational hazards. And one of the things I think we can probably see is that military service in combat makes you more likely to have problems related to that because of the exposure to traumatic events. Um, sometimes being in a training environment where you're constantly retraining the same combat skills can have an impact where you don't have a mental health disorder, but you are, it's almost like muscle memory to where if you perceive a threat, you train so much that you act almost instinctively on it. And we see issues a lot of times, a lot of times with Veterans who are sleeping with a spouse in bed and they wake up, they get startled, the spouse moves, they think they're being attacked, they have that instinctual reaction, put up their fist and all of a sudden you have a really serious injury. And in all honesty, one of the questions as a society we, and as a court system we need to ask ourselves is, does that really match with the definition of domestic and interpersonal violence that we're used to? Or is this an entirely different type of situation when it occurs? And that's just one example, but it poses significant challenges in terms of how we deal with, with non-symptoms, right, traditionally. And when symptoms are at once a result of a mental health condition or overtraining, so to speak, and also a crime, that's where we get into really unique challenges. So you may have seen this. This is the veteran's brain uh, illustration, which kind of is developed by mental health professionals to highlight how it's a different set of circumstances we're dealing with. There's a lot more risk. There's a lot more concern with things that do not affect everyone in the community in the same way when they don't have military service. If we look at some recent publications, uh, I'll go through the list there, but On Killing, I'm sure you may have had a chance to teach with the author, West Point psychologist, talks all about the training piece and how, how over time as, as we have prepared service members to engage an enemy, right? They talk about World War II training versus Vietnam training and how they made targets look more like actual people so that service members would get used to the idea of shooting another person because so many people in combat were freezing and not wanting to do it because of the humanity piece. So that's that in, in on killing talks about what when you have this indoctrination process, how are you rewiring someone to overcome those natural inhibitions? And truly the idea of how do you turn off the switch when those same skills aren't necessary in the uh, civilian world, that, that is a piece of it, which is, I'd highly recommend the book on killing. Um, Black Hearts is a book about s some terrible uh, rape and murder and maiming uh, of, of just third country nationals uh, during Iraq um, by US forces. It focuses on the fact that this was a unit that was pretty much out in the middle of nowhere and not getting much support and devolved from that point to where you had horrible war crimes. And the, the underlying theme there is certain types of conditions in combat com combined with a lack of quality leadership can lead to horrible consequences. So the combat environment itself during combat operations can actually lead to mental health conditions and a criminal behavior and abandonment of morals and values. The Lethal Warriors book is an examination of Fort Carson, Colorado, specifically with 
redeployed, recently redeployed service members and how there are many of the individuals who are coming back in that particular location were arrested and just violent offenses and, and just how the entire community was affected in that one particular instance. This is a document created by, I believe it's Military One Source, but it is an illustration of the Marine who recently came back sleeping on the floor, not able to sleep as we heard about, and uh, having a bat by his side and anytime a noise is outside he feels the need to patrol his home and his wife is very concerned about how he's been changed. And this is in a comic book format. To the, the, at the end of this story, the emphasis was, you've got to get help if you're experiencing this. And, and, and this is probably something a lot of you readers can relate to. But we have, we have this message that this is a much more common thing as our deployments and redeployments have continued. This is a, a very uh, small text. And if you want it, I can get it for you. But there's kind of a recognition here that you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is one of the unique conditions because you actually have to have a cause. There has to be some kind of cause for it. In a lot of other cases, um, mental health diagnoses don't require you to identify a cause. And it was thought for a long time that this cause had to be where you were in, in extreme fear of death or serious injury to yourself or others. Uh, in order to meet the criteria for that causal event that is that creates PTSD. More recently, this, this table kind of shows that there are other concepts now, like moral injury, where they're saying you can have these symptoms. It doesn't have to be a life threat scenario. It could be a situation where you were forced to violate sincerely held moral beliefs and felt compelled to do it by someone in a position of control over you. And so uh, instead of just asking, have you been harmed, other questions are now being presented to our veterans. Were you ever in a situation where you felt compelled to violate your own morals or military law or whatever? And you hear a lot coming up in terms of atrocities. And it's quite interesting. And in fact, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, DSM-5, just explicitly said that you can get PTSD from repeated exposure to hearing stories from others and witnessing what they experience without having yourself have, have having had to gone through that. So it's, it's quite interesting, this idea of secondary traumatic stress as well, that it's not just you fearing for your life. It could be frequent exposure to others fearing for their lives and bringing you into it. And unfortunately, some symptoms commonly result in behavior that can be considered or is criminal. And in a lot of cases, we're talking about incidents involving weapons, right? You have so many people who were just, who come back feeling like they have to be armed in order to be safe, just the way they were when they were deployed. And what happens when you have a nightclub and you're there and you get into a fight and you go for the weapon and then all of a sudden you've got some serious charges. So weapons related charges, self-medication with alcohol and drugs, driving violations, communicating threats, etc. These are all the kinds of behaviors that can actually be traced to some of the, the most prominent symptoms of, of post-traumatic stress disorder and some other operational stress injuries. Um, I put this slide up because these are, this is a, an Army combat stress publication that's actually talking about misconduct stress behaviors, and it's actually officially recognized in the military's own uh, field manuals and doctrine that exposure to combat operations can result in, in all kinds of criminal behaviors, including rape and, and, and various horrible offenses. And the double-edged sword is, is an example from the manual, which talks about you know exposure to combat environments from a leadership perspective or from a military perspective. It can create the kind of stress that is very important on the battlefield that makes you stay alert and makes you aware 
of uh, potential threats. But the other side of that sword is the same kind of uh, behaviors can also lead to misconduct if, it, if they're not channeled in the right way. And that's the emphasis on leadership that was also recently documented in the uh, Army 2020 uh, study about the you know, misconduct in the armed forces. Uh, that's a statistic that's fascinating. The, the biggest one there is that uh, uh, they did a study of 77,800 uh, Marines who had been deployed uh, to combat between 2001 and 2007. And they said combat deployed Marines with a PTSD diagnosis were 11 times more likely to engage in the most serious forms of misconduct. Um, really interesting comments. And, and uh, you know, they didn't have to be staying in the military there, but uh, it suggests that exposure to these traumatic events and symptoms does, in fact, in some cases, not all, but some cases, translate to misconduct or, or provides the background of misconduct that, that is addressed through court systems and disciplinary actions. This is the Marine Corps 2010 uh, Combat and Operational Stress Control Manual. I just wanted to highlight that to you because it's the first real official recognition of things like moral injury and these non-life-threatening causes uh, as being prominent, uh, prominent results of combat operations. And operational stress injuries, when we want to think about offenses related to them, I, I look a lot at the military offenses, but it's also civilian ones. I, I'd like to highlight two right here. Uh, Self-punishment, you know, this idea of survivor's guilt, of, of not having been capable of saving someone, of blaming yourself for the loss of your subordinates or your peers in an attack. Um, some people are almost resigned to living a life of hell in order to straighten things out. The perception is if I was able to live and they died, then I can't live happily. I have to punish myself is essentially how it goes. But you, you can see that related to some of these misconduct activities. Um, you can also see uh, adverse reactions to psychotropic medications responsible for some of these offenses that active duty service members and veterans uh, are being charged with. It's just this idea of titration of medication that it's not an exact science, that you know, to address trauma and, and medical conditions, you have to change dosages of medications. And in the course of doing that, someone might not be able to sleep, might have to drink themselves to sleep, they perceive. Uh, and that can lead to criminal conduct. Um, so it's, it's, it's more than just the typical set of behaviors that we might think are related to criminal conduct. Uh, very quickly, uh, avoidance of help seeking. I, I say it's the ultimate manifestation of selflessness in military culture. Certainly it's one of the army values and I think this is taking selflessness to its extreme. We don't want to get help because we want to be of maximum utilization to our unit. We start asking for help. We need to get treatment. We have to go to appointments. We can't go to formations. We can't do training. We might be listed as non-deployable. But, but we don't want to leave our teammates struggling because they have one less to go out on patrol, essentially. So it, it actually is a very ironic situation that this may be leading to harmful consequences in the future. And this study that was conducted and published in the, uh, I believe it's the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, they looked at five different countries' armed forces and uh, reasons for not seeking treatment among their militaries. This includes the United States, uh, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada. And quite interestingly, across the board, the same types of responses were presented by all of those service members of these different countries. My unit leadership might treat me differently and, and big, I would be perceived as weak over some of the reasons why, prominent reasons why individuals who needed help didn't seek it. So that's, it's, it's more than just 
a U.S. military thing. It's a military thing all over. The sequential intercept model, uh, a new paradigm for viewing treatment as an optimal approach to veteran criminality. You know, we have a society, a uh, criminal justice system, and the, the, the fear is when we have so many individuals who are under correctional custody in this country, that's an older statistic. It's actually been increasing now even more so, especially with rising crime rates. We have so many individuals, there's a concern that we're not able to distinguish that people who have mental health treatment needs, maybe instead of arrest, or in addition to arrest, we need to address their underlying problems, their condition. And um, this criminalization idea is that it's, it's not a positive thing for society to criminalize symptoms of mental illness without providing an avenue to address the problems. Uh, the sequential intercept model was developed as a means to identify predictable junctures in the course of the criminal justice involvement where someone could be diverted away from a punitive response and actually given the treatment they need. And it's a five-point model, and uh, Munitz and Griffin in 2006 are the ones who came up with this con conceptualization of it. But it basically says, hey, the most effective point at which you can intervene is before you arrest the person. If you have law enforcement with training and know-how, why not identify people who have mental health issues approach them differently and get them into a community treatment center that would be available rather than arresting them and sending them to jail. Um, and that is, that is one of the things that they're doing. Police officers are now routinely trained. I don't know how successful it is in all cases, right? But they're routinely trained in crisis intervention training. And I, I want to emphasize to you that that training has a mandatory veterans component. And in addition to that, you have, uh, you have uh, VA psychiatrists who participate in that. Well, it goes all the way through. You also have that model being adopted by the Department of Veterans Affairs. They have veterans justice outreach specialists who go into jails, try to find veterans and get them linked up with the uh, counseling they need. And quite often, veterans in jail and prison also don't know about the benefits they're entitled to. And, the VA treats this as a primary means of preventing veteran homelessness if you can help these people get on their feet, and it's quite interesting. I know I'm limited in time. I'd love to address more, but I wanted to give you a thought of some applied examples. We have over 166 veterans treatment court programs across the country, with many more in, in the planning sessions. This is a part of the problem-solving court movement. Uh, created by judges. If we go back to uh, Miami-Dade County when drug crimes were booming in Florida, judges were seeing drug addicts coming through their court systems in a revolving door of criminality. And the argument was, hey, you're actually serving a life sentence, but it's 30 days at a time. And can we do something better? Can we maybe have you get intensive treatment, come back and report to the judge on a regular basis, and then use the leverage of potential criminal confinement or whatever to encourage you to actually comply with treatment and get back on your feet. And it's been overall, with of course some exceptions, a tremendous hit. There are over 2,147 drug courts. And our 1Ls can tell you from our writing exercise that we have drug courts in Mississippi and we have family drug courts in Mississippi because they're so successful. Uh, and these problem solving courts are part of a larger spectrum. There's over 14 types. There's courts for prostitutes. There's courts for DUI offenses because there's mental health treatment courts. And veterans courts are kind of like described as a hybrid between drug courts and mental health courts because a lot of times symptoms that go untreated result in self-medication. So you have drug issues and you have PTSD issues to deal with and OSI issues. Uh, I want to tell you that aside from your veterans treatment courts, in a number of uh, jurisdictions, sheriffs, especially sheriffs who are veterans, have started specialized housing units for veterans in jails and prisons, where veterans can talk to each other, 
can try to uh, help calm each other down uh, and can learn about their benefits. Uh, it's been recognized as being successful. That's Sheriff Randall Liberty in Kennebec County, Maine. He is a sergeant major in the reserve component. He has PTSD. He saw veterans coming to his jail at a higher number. He created a specialized dorm to deal with them. And he has this thought, it's called uh, solutions-based confinement. And pretty much he says, you know, if veterans treatment courts are there as problem-solving courts, we're coming up with solutions in a confined setting. And one of the things he did is they don't use the automatic doors to lock in the veterans ward because it sounds too much like a machine gun closing with the automatic door. And that's just one example of things that they do to try not to exacerbate the symptoms, especially in a place where it's so likely to be under more stress. And these are veterans' dorms. This is a uh, veterans' organization, Styles Unit in Texas, where they're having a color guard allowed by the uh, jail to wear distinctive uniforms to signify veteran status for official occasions. And you can see the pride that they have in doing that. In prison, you don't normally have pride in anything. So this is a way to bring them back using these team traits that they had in the past. You have sayings on walls with mottos and, and pictures and change the setting to try to build up this cohesion that was so effective when they were on active duty. That's a jail I visited in Maryland where they're able to wear special uniforms in jail which shows the number of years they served, etc. But these are adaptations to criminal justice we wouldn't normally think of. But arguably, all of these court systems and all of these prisons and jails have implemented these changes in recognition that there are unique pressures and concerns. And my argument would, of course, be, in terms of the path forward and policy perspectives, this is a Medal of Honor winner. He's trying to convince people to get help and not avoid seeking treatment. It's uh, part of a, an effort to show that even Medal of Honor winners needed help or recipients. I, don't, I know they don't like to be called winners, right? Recipients of the Medal of Honor. But what does he say? He says, don't let the enemy defeat you at home. And in a way, we heard this, you know, we talked about the war in law school. Who's, we, we're talking about bringing the war home and how do we actually deal with that and stop that war. And uh, we're not just talking about sympathy or gratitude or saying thank you. We're really talking about fundamental obligations here if help has not been provided and we have an opportunity to marry up someone in need with help, then maybe it's more than just saying thank you. And also, there's not an effort here to try to paint all veterans as people suffering from mental health disorders, or all veterans with mental health disorders as individuals who will commit crimes. In fact, it's just the opposite. We're talking about a small, when we talk about criminal justice involvement, it's a very small percentage, but I want to make the point that it's significant. That small group is significant, and perhaps where we need to focus the mo most because of the manner in which it affects society. Finally, let's not forget that attorneys are also first responders, and if you have a veteran as a client, recognize that you may be the first person who has an opportunity as well to identify these needs. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Evan. So, uh, in addition to thanking the panel and everyone here, you know, uh, this couldn't happen without Dean Scott. Uh, and Dean Rosenblatt and Dean Scott weren't able to be here today, uh, but they wanted to express that uh, they, they would be here in spirit, and we're very happy that Dean Will is here, uh, and, and Gordon and some of the faculty. Uh, so we thought we're over, but we could spend a little bit of time if anyone has, like to open the floor to some conversation.